Hi, this is Minez Marie, the Soldier of Mary. I'm continuing this series on different insights from mystics, saints, and today I'm going to talk about insights from the fathers of the church into the life of our Lord and his Holy Mother. Of course, really, the insights from the fathers of the church are of a kind of different degree, potentially, than insights from mystics. That's because the mystics, well, they're obviously getting mystic visions, but fathers of the church quite potentially are passing on unwritten traditions of the apostles about the life of the lives of Jesus and Mary. So they're kind of in a different category. Probably some of them also had mystical insights, but um, but moreover, they have this kind of testimonial. Uh, testimonial insights into the life of Christ and of his Holy Mother. And so um, and so we can read the Fathers of the Church in order to uh, open up aspects of the Gospels that are not so clear or to get details filled in about certain aspects of the of the Gospels. And even like people sometimes talk about the apocryphal Gospels and they use this word apocryphal. We've got to be careful not to be too um, too hard on some of these um, non I think it's better to call many of them non-canonical gospels because a fair number of them contain they don't contain doctrinal error they just weren't included in the canon of scripture because you know for, for diverse reasons one of which the um, fact that they weren't being read out at mass in in churches and they were they were not considered to be written by apostles etc etc um and so for instance like the one that's called the proto evangelium of james there's a lot of genuine uh, tradition in there and another one is the what is it um gamaliel the account of the passion by pseudo gamaliel um Again, that's another one that, that is, and the history of, I think, Joseph the Carpenter. Um, and there are a number of other documents uh, that have been papyri documents also from Egypt that have um, fragments of early church um, traditions um, that are probably taken from so-called Gnostic, not Gnostic, um, uh, non-canonical gospels that are, um, that are useful, that do convey aspects of tradition, like, for instance, the names of loads of details about Our Lady's life that is taken to be genuine is found principally in the non-canonical Gospels and corroborated in visions to saints, many of whom were unaware of these uh, non-canonical Gospels, because a lot of them only came to light uh, in the 19th century. A lot of these stuff only, only came to light in the 19th century, uh, when we were able to, uh, when Great Britain, a lot of it was Great Britain, were there's the Anglican scholars, a lot of it by Anglicans actually, were able to get hold of, of Syriac and um, ancient texts, um, mainly for, a lot of them from Egypt, and were able to translate them. Um, sometimes they were in Greek as well, sometimes they were in whatever, Armenian, ancient languages, and to publish them for the first time. And so many saints uh, throughout history really would have had no awareness of these, um, these these texts anyway okay so so i think i think that in terms of insights we can gain insights from these non-canonical gospels most definitely and we should be aware of them because some of them are very rich in giving insights that are corroborated by data mystics um, and so in this uh, little video, I'm going to probably refer to some of those, uh, some of those gospel, some of those gospel sources, um, and um, like with the other videos, I have made a a book of rosary meditations drawn from the fathers of the church, what I call the fathers of the church, which includes also the non-canonical gospels, some of them, uh, the ones that are uh, that are christologically sound and which don't have gnostic tendencies. Um, and which uh, say things that are in accordance with uh, the approved mystics. Um, and also um, I, within that label, Father of the Church, um, I would include basically early church writers, really, uh, not necessarily all can canonized, canon canonized, yeah, 
and not all of them necessarily um, super early. Um, like for instance, going as far as uh, St. Bernard uh, as the last father. I think some people do call him the last Western father, but he's a doctor of the church. So whether you can be a father and a doctor, um, you know, that's, uh, that's something I'm not 100% clear about, but I guess maybe in his case you can be. So let's look at some insights that we gain from the fathers of the church about the lives of Jesus and Mary. So, so let's take this one from St. John Chrysostom, which I really love, which is um, the Archangel Gabriel receiving his orders from Almighty God. The Archangel Gabriel received his commandments from God, from the Lord. It was as if he was told, go, O angel, for sin has soared my creation and has darkened where I created beauty. I'm going to have mercy on him who was attacked and I wish to make war with him who fought against him. I wish for all of the heavenly powers to know, but to you alone I impart the mystery. Go to the Virgin Mary, go to the spiritual gate of which the prophet said, glorious things have been said of you, O city of God. Go to my paradise, go to the eastern city, go to her is the, who is the worthy dwelling place of the word. Go to the second heaven on earth, tell her of my coming, go to her who is my prepared holy place. Go to the bridal chamber of my incarnation. Go to the pure bridal chamber of my nativity in the flesh. Speak to the ears of this rational ark, but do not be fearsome. Do not trouble the soul of the virgin. Instead, first cry out to her with a voice of joy and say to her, Hail, O full of grace. Beautiful insight into the scene immediately prior to the Annunciation. And and then we get one of the great fathers, and he is a father, St. Maximus the Confessor. Um, he has a wonderful book, The Life of Our Lady, which has only just been translated into English in the last 20 years. And uh, Maximus's Life of Our Lady is very much something akin to... Um, something akin to St. Bridget of Sweden, actually, or, or, or Ag Mary of Agrida or, or Anne Catherine Emmerich. It really is in that category of um, giving a kind of biography and also a, a first person account of what Our Lady experienced. It's really quite something. Um, so here's what Our Lady said, or something that uh, uh, happened immediately at the Annunciation. But consider the wisdom of the blessed and all Holy Virgin and her excessive love of virginity. She believed the Archangel's message, but was astonished by the matter. That is why she answered and said, How can this be? For I have not known a man. Nor is this possible, because I have been consecrated immaculately to God, and without a man conception is not possible. For this was her fear and distress, that he related the loss of her virginity, which was steadfast in her heart to remain in virginity until she died. So another insight, again, that's something that we all know that Our Lady made this vow of virginity, but, but why do we know it? And uh, it's because of writers like St. Maximus conveying this apostolic tradition. I love this. Uh, another source of early tradition is, is liturgy. And there's, um, there are some lovely hymns from the Syriac church. Um, this is a a little extract from a 6th century dialogue hymn, a hymn that they would sing in their church. Again, about Our Lady at the Annunciation. O angel, replied the maiden, reveal to me why it has pleased your Lord to dwell in a mere poor girl. The world is full of king's daughters, so why does he want me, who am totally destitute? The angel responded, it would have been easy for him to dwell in a rich girl, but it is with your poverty that he has fallen in love, so that he may become one with the poor and enrich them when he has been revealed. In that case, O angel, replied the virgin, I will not answer back. If the Holy Spirit shall come to me, I am his main servant, and he has authority. Let it be to me, Lord, in accordance with your word. Again, a charming interpretation of Our Lady in dialogue with the angel in a more extended manner. Um, let's... Uh, let me show you another, another um, particular approach that the fathers have. The fathers often want to teach us something. 
a lot of their their and a lot of these uh paragraphs and the writings of the fathers are taken from sermons so they've got a view in mind a view of teaching and helping us to convert more thoroughly so so like for instance um let me read you one about um let me let me take one about uh, a bit later on in the in the um story of our lord um yeah at the finding of the boy jesus in the temple from origin let us then also ourselves be subject to our superiors jesus the son of god is subject to joseph and mary i must be subject to the bishop who has been constituted my father it seems that Joseph knew that Jesus was greater than him, and for that reason, in awe, he moderated his authority. And so, let everyone see that often the one who is subject is the greater. If those of you who are higher in dignity understand this, you will not be elated with pride, knowing that your superior may be subject to you. Imagine, there's a, you know, there's some, um, there's some um, teaching there that he's drawing from the. Um, well a bit after the finding of the child Jesus when it says and he went down and was obedient to them and then there's this um, a similar a similar insight in the writings of Saint Bernard we read have you not read in the gospel the example of obedience set by the boy Jesus for the imitation of all other youths who aspire after holiness for though he had remained behind in Jerusalem and declared that it was necessary for him to be, be about his father's business, when his parents found him and would not consent him staying any longer, he did not disdain to follow them to Nazareth. The master obeyed his disciples. God obeyed man. The word, the wisdom of the father, obeyed a poor artisan and his consort. And that is not all. The inspired narrative goes on to say, and he was subject to them. So that a similar teaching from saint bernard on uh, the obedience of christ and and the obedience that we should have saint john chrysostom at the um fall of saint peter has this one that really strikes me and is an amazing insight on not only the character of saint peter but also on the priesthood so i'm going to read this one out and thus it was that divine providence permitted peter to fall first in order that he might be less severe to sinners from the remembrance of his own fall. Peter, the teacher and master of the whole world, sinned and obtained pardon. For this reason, I supposed, the priesthood was not given to angels, because being without sin themselves, they would punish sinners without pity. Instead, passable, sinful men are placed over other men, in order that remembering their own weakness, they might be merciful to others great isn't it saint john chrysostom he's an amazing he really is an amazing preacher and his his words still carry power to this day one of the things the fathers do is is they uh, like to point out a bit like bridget of sweden or rather i should say that she's a bit like them that they like to try and explain uh aspects of the scene so theophlact uh, who is uh someone that uh, comments on the gospels quite a bit he gives us this explanation at the crowning of thorns the soldiers clothed him with a cloak as it were the imperial purple they gave him a reed for a scepter and a crown of thorns for a diadem they paid him homage in mockery but if they did these things in derision you must understand them in a more spiritual manner as something not merely done to but also accomplished by jesus the scarlet cloak reveals our nature, bloody and murderous, which he assumed and sanctified by wearing it. The crown is made of thorns, which are the sins resulting from our cares for this life. These Christ consumes with his own divinity, for his head represents his divinity. The reed is a symbol of our weak and crumbling nature, which the Lord assumed. By receiving insults in his ears, he healed Eve of the whispering of the serpent which had entered her ears so the father's doing one of the things they do best which is pointing out a meaning in in symbolism and a deeper deeper meaning in in in, the, in those symbols i want to read you now one uh, from one of those um non-canonical gospels 
which is uh, this one you probably won't have heard much about, Pseudo Gamaliel, probably written in the 5th century, but I think this one would really capture something. It's about Our Lady seeking Our Lord uh, on the way to Calvary. The Virgin, therefore, walked through the streets of Jerusalem towards the place of execution. The people who saw the Virgin passing by said to one another, From where is this whirling woman? And the market trader said, we have never seen this woman buying any from our store, anything from our stores. Others said, this is a foreign woman, for she walks in these streets as if she doesn't know them. Some men who recognized in John the disciple of the Lord Jesus said, this may perhaps be the mother going to see her son crucified. Some were saying, look at how beautiful her face is, even amidst her tears and others her face resembles that of her son you know there's there's insight in that isn't there and there's real meditation real fruits of meditation even if we're not dealing with something that is that literally occurred it allows us to enter the scene and allows us to draw deeper into contemplation of our lady of sorrows and of as her as a real human being who interacted with others Let's um, let me now look at something. Yeah, that that um, features in all of the mystics: Anne Catherine Emmerich, Venerable Mary of Agreda, Bridget of Sweden. I think Bridget of Sweden, not hundred percent, but it, it, it appears again and again. And it's the, the account of Christ going down into the underworld. Alphonsus definitely he has this, um, and we actually find this in another non-canonical scripture of the fourth century pseudo nicodemus which i'll i'll read out because again it's 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 definitely um it definitely fills in uh, an area with a beautiful um meditation for us and the lord set his cross in the midst of hades which is the sign of victory and which will remain even to eternity and the lord stretching forth his hand made the sign of the cross upon adam upon his forehead and upon all his saints, the patriarchs, prophets, martyrs, and forefathers. And holding Adam by the right hand, he went up from the powers below, and all the saints followed him. And as he was going, holy David cried out aloud, saying, Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his only arm have brought salvation. In like manner also all the saints of God, falling on their knees at the feet of the Lord, said with one voice, You have come, O Redeemer of the world. You have foretold by your law and your prophets. You have, as you foretold by your law and your prophets, you have fulfilled their words by your deeds. You have redeemed the living by your cross and by your death upon the cross. You have come down to us in your majesty to rescue us from the powers below and from unending death. So it's um, it's a beautiful, beautiful scene that, that we can meditate on in the uh, first glorious mystery, our Lord's resurrection from the dead, because the resurrection affected the souls in limbo. Just uh, it was just something we didn't we didn't get to hear too much about, except for that little bit in Saint Peter's uh, letters, and then um, I think that's it, isn't it? Um, Saint Peter's letters, maybe that's it. Uh, the only reference in Scripture to that, perhaps Book of Apocalypse. Anyway. Um, Let's close now with um, something really characteristic of some of the Western fathers, particularly um, Saint Leo, Saint Leo the Great. I'm going to read um, something for the Ascension because Saint Leo, he, he wants us to um, learn something from the Ascension and apply it to ourselves. So he, he um, has this insight and so, dearly beloved, let us rejoice with spiritual joy and with gladness pay God worthy thanks and raise our minds unimpeded to those heights where Christ is. Minds that have heard the call to be uplifted must not be pressed down by earthly affections. They that are foredained to things eternal must not be taken up with things that perish. They that have entered on the way of truth must not be entangled in treacherous snares. Each one of us must so take our course through these temporal things as to remember that we are sojourning in the veil of this world in which even though we meet with some attractions, 
We must not sinfully embrace them, but bravely pass through them. Wise words from the Holy Pope, St. Leo the Great. Um, and because, you know, because maybe this channel is about Our Lady, maybe maybe I'll, I'll uh, give another little piece about Our Lady from St. John of Damascus. Um, let's hope it's... Um, Let's hope that it's not one that I gave in, in the uh, meditation on the assumption which has, um, which has already, um, which has already been shown on this channel. Let's see, they've got, I've got two in front of me. Um, oh, I don't know if either of these were used. Um, well, apologies if it, if it was used. What then shall we call this mystery of yours? Death? Your blessed soul is naturally parted from your blissful and undefiled body, and the body is delivered to the grave. Yet it does not remain in death, nor is it the prey of corruption. The body of her, whose virginity remained unspotted in childbirth, was preserved in its incorruption, and was taken to a better, diviner place where death is not but eternal life. Therefore, I will not call your sacred transformation death, but rest or going home. And it is more truly a going home. Putting off corporal things, you dwell now in a happier state. How could limbo open its gates to her? How could corruption touch the life-giving body? These are things quite foreign to the soul and body of God's mother. Death trembled before her. In her poaching her son, Death had learned to experience from his sufferings and had grown wiser. The gloomy descent to hell was not for her, but a joyous, easy and sweet passage to heaven. Nice way to conclude this video. And some of the insights, like there we have, we have the Assumption of Our Lady in the, in the Fathers of the Church. Um, as we meditate on the Assumption, it's really helpful to know exactly what happened. St. John of Damascus is probably conveying um traditions that were passed down to him so it's really good for us to find out about them thankfully we have lots of translations of these into english on like new advent has got a lot of them archive internet archive um and also there's a book that i've prepared the holy rosary through the writings of the fathers of the church which has bead by bead rosary meditations taken from the fathers of the church. May Almighty God bless you. May Our Lady intercede for you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.